cloud. Okay. Good afternoon. This is the WCSA. Uh, we have a special lecture today. Her name is Christine Houck. She has an MA in the history of decorative arts from Parsons School of Design and C Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum and a BA in art history from Vassar College. Uh, she's also an adjunct professor for the University of Connecticut in the digital media and design department. And she also uh, runs design studio Graphiste. So uh, with that ado, go ahead, Christine. She's going to be bringing up the PowerPoint and we can start from there. Hi, um, hello. Um, my name is Christine Hauk and I am delighted to be here today. Um, I, I'm here today to talk about Harry Batoya. And I first discovered uh, the amazing Harry Batoya in 2016. And um, when the Museum of Arts and Design, or MAD, gave him his first retrospective exhibitions, um, Bent, Cast, and Forged, The Jewelry of Harry Batoya, and The Atmosphere uh, for Enjoyment, which is of his sound sculptures. Um, if, uh, as um, you know, uh, Jason mentioned, if anyone has any questions uh, during the presentations, feel free to write them in the chat window. And um, after the presentation, I can answer those questions or any other questions that you may have. Um, I wanna start out with um, who is Harry Batoyer? Is there anyone um, who, um, Ha, knows uh, about the artist Harry Batoya. Um, so Harry Batoya is um, a uh, Renaissance, a modern Renaissance man. He's the very definition of. Um, Okay, sorry. He's the very definition of a modern Renaissance man, a person who has a wide interest and is an expert in several areas. As a sculptor working almost exclusively in metal, he created monumental architectural installations. Um, and he uh, created screens for corporate interiors of buildings um, designed by his friend and architect, Aero Sarnam and uh, smaller freestanding sculptures for modern homes. Um, as a painter and printmaker, he employed, uh, explored line and forms that he would realize in, in his three-dimensional work as he developed a language for non-objective art and biomorphic abstraction a decade before World War II. As a furniture designer, he created the diamond chair out of welded metal for his Cranbrook friend, Florence Knoll. As a musician, he created and played Sanambian sculptures that emit magical tonal sounds as they sway and move. But Batoya's interests are included, included jewelry. At first as a student at Detroit's legendary Cass Technical High School, and later as a student, and then as an instructor at Cranbrook Academy of Art. What we're seeing on the, uh, what we're seeing on the first slide here is, um, Harry Batoya working in his, um, you know, studio, and we he's shown sketching sunlight straw as we see uh, as we see he's sketching that, and on his left is a small scale model uh, for sunlight straw. So um, as we can see in this first slide, when we're talking about him being a modern Renaissance man, um, we see on the left here. Um, we're seeing the Cressage Chapel from 1955. Um, it's in, in MIT. And right, we're seeing right in the back here, we're seeing Harry Batoya's uh, altarpiece screen. Um, and this, uh, this uh, Cressage Chapel for MIT was designed by the legendary 20th century design and architect, Eero Saarinen. Um, we are looking at 
a free uh, standing, it's a, it's a multi-planes lead free form sculpture that was designed by Harry Batoya on the top here. We can see this. And then down below, we can see that same free form sculpture in a null interior. Um, Harry Batoy was also a uh, painter and a printmaker. And on the left here, um, we see this untitled monotype. He didn't name uh, many of his monotypes or prints or paintings. Um, it's a non-objective polychrome block print, circa 1943. And to the right here, um, the first uh, image on Clay's red green gradation from 1921. And uh, to the right is uh, Batoya's 1943 um, uh, untitled monotype. And you can see how Batoya's uh, you know, monotype print, painting monotype print was um, you know, inspired by Paul Clay. Now we're gonna go into some highlights of uh, about Harry Batoya and give him some you give you some background about him. So in, in uh, 1915, um, Harry Batoya was um, was born Ereto Harry Batoya in San Lorenzo, Friuli, uh, Italy, on March 10th, 1915. When you look at the left here, um, you will see um, in the up left-hand corner, you'll see the village of San Lorenzo. Um, it's in the Valsoni region. Um, and uh, Friuli, uh, Venezia, Guili is a northern, northeast Italian region bordering Austria, Slovenia, and the Adriatic Sea. And to the right here, we see a very handsome, a very handsome Harry Batoya. And this photograph is from Cranbrook, um, um, museum. In 1920, um, Harry Batoya, you can see on the left here in this photograph here, um, is Harry Batoya and to his right is Orestes. He, uh, Harry Batoya emigrated with his father to the United States and joined his brother Orestes in Detroit. He earned a scholarship to Cass Technical High School in Detroit where he graduated in 1936. And he also attended lectures at the Detroit Society of Arts and Crafts. In 1937, Harry was a graduate student in Cranbrook Academy of Art in Bloomsbury Hills, Michigan. Um, his colleagues there were uh, Aero Saarinen, who we've already mentioned, Charles Eames and Florence Noel were classmates of his. Um, to the left here in this photograph, you're actually seeing um, Harry Batoya is right here. Um, to his right is Charles Eames, and this is Benjamin Baldwin. And um, the woman in this shot, it's, it's all from 1939, and the woman in this shot is not identified, but um, they were his classmates in Cranbrook Academy of Art, and they entered a Smithsonian competition. Um, so that's what the shot where we're looking at is here. And in 1942, he moved from being a uh, graduate student at the Cranbrook Academy of Art to he becomes director of metalworking and printing for the Cranbrook Academy of Art. And that is such an important um, thing for him because it becomes his laboratory of ideas and he focuses on jewelry. In 1943, um, Harry marries Brigitte uh, Valentiner. She is daughter of Wilhelm Reinhold Valentiner, an art historian and director of the Detroit Museum. Um, in 1943 and 1946, he is uh, working in product design. And in this top, this top uh, photograph here, you can see Harry Batoyer, he's working on a product design. And I think this is from a tea service and you see in the background is Charles Eames. Um, in 
Um, in 1950, he's invited by Knoll um, to go to Bartow, Pennsylvania to create the Batoya collection of both sculpture and furniture. And in the lower left-hand corner here, we see an interior with his diamond chair. This is a Knoll interior. And to the right here, we see a close-up of the very famous uh, 421 diamond chair. It's a welded steel and it's a latticework chair. And I wanted to show include this photograph here. This is Harry Batoyer and he's welding the diamond chair. And I thought that was just so interesting. Um, Harry Batoya um, was also a musician and in 1960, he created and played Sonambient. He called his sound sculptures Sonambient sculptures. They're also known as tonal sculptures. And we see here on the left, he's actually playing one of his tonal sculptures. Um, and to the right, um, we see a split image. And on the left-hand side here, we see Harry in the midst of some of his other uh, tonal sculptures or synambient sculptures. And to the right is a gong pendant. And now the reason why I'm showing you this is because I wanted to show you the connection between um, jewelry and, um, you know, at the very beginnings in the 1930s and all the way to the 1960s, when he um, created his sound sculptures. So this gong, keep this in mind. So this gong pendant, this gong um, will be used in his sound sculptures all the way later in the 1960s. So for today's talk, we're focusing on Batoya's jewelry because his exploration of mediums and processes originated first in his jewelry designs. In the 1960s, we will see how Batoya reintroduces his gong shape and from gong pendant jewelry into his larger Sonambian sound sculptures. Several of these sound sculptures were displayed in the Atmosphere for Enjoyment exhibition that I mentioned um, when we first um, started talking about his exhibitions at MAD. And, and that exhibition was at the other end of the floor from the bent, cast, and forged exhibition. Uh, visitors were encouraged to interact with the sculptures and create music. So with that lead in, we will focus on his jewelry. So Harry Batoya as a jeweler. And just to give you a little bit of background and some show you some examples of his jewelry. Um, this is jewelry he created between 1935 and 1947. Um, he explored uh, line um, form, line, and three-dimensionality in his jewelry on a manageable scale. And an example of that is you look to the left here. This is his very first uh, necklace that he uh, created. Um, he, it's out of cast and fabricated silver. It's, you can see here, uh, you can see sort of the, the chain here. You have some, some detailing here. You have this semi-precious stone that's carved. It's from 1935. And he actually designed this uh, when he was a high school student in the Cass Technical School in um, Detroit. Um, to the right here, we see a carved aluminum ring of his. Um, it's from the 1940s. And um, below we see this fish pendant and it's from circa 1940s. And this is an example of the second um, item here where I'm saying he actually melted down, Harry went in and melted down scraps and salvaged silver flatware. And from this, he made this fish pendant. Um, he also improvised and experimented with different materials gold, silver, brass, aluminum, copper. And he tried out many, many experiments with many, many different processes, such as bending, casting, forging, soldering, welding, and so on. And this necklace that is to the right is a of uh, the fishbone pendant. This necklace from 19... 1942, uh, 1943, is made out of brass because it's actually a brass collar. Can you see this? Um, the brass collar has forged elements. Um, it has rivets. You see these rivets all along the hair. We, it has pendants. You see these sort of welted 
wilted uh, shapes here that curve around the shoker here. So here we're going to come to uh, a page on the left here. Uh, keep this in mind as we go through more examples of his uh, jewelry um, and other commissions, sculptural commissions and his sound sculptures. Um, this page is of his uh, 27 sketches of his jewelry, so numbered one through 27. Um, and um, we're going to be looking next at a, a, a video called Metal Dimensions. And uh, I wanted to just tell you that Harry Batoy is one of the few contemporary sculptors who welded constructions um, that evolved directly from nature. Um, in this uh, video, we will see Batoya working in a studio and he'll talk about his working method for sculpture firsthand. So I'm going to switch to Jason now and he's going to run this uh, video and then we will come back and continue with the presentation. So Jason. Not all the things begin at the uh, drafting boards, but that seems to be one of the quickest ways to do it, perhaps the lazy method. Little time is required to capture a fleeting thought, but quite a deliberate effort is then made and a very almost systematic way of assembling this in three dimensions. Good, Christine. Um, the the video didn't um, it did it stop? Okay. It okay. Sorry. Okay. So I hope I hope you. Um, I thought that was really interesting about his working method. Um, and it also tied in with what we were talking about as far as his sketches as being a preliminary step when he um, is creating anything, right? So I wanted to read to you uh, really, I just, it, this is not the full quote, but I wanted to read to you um, something that, uh, you know, the credo that Harry Petoya followed um, for his for his designing. And it was actually posted um, in the exhibition for uh, Bendcast and, and Forge. So here's a listen to Harry Batoya. Um, I did not start with a written credo or manifesto. School days exposed me to the hows more than to the whys or the whats. Nature as an influence always strong, enthusiastic beginnings, and recognition of failures marking a long quest to seek and sometimes find a form, a structure, a sound, or a way, an immersion into the vast recesses of the unconscious, leading to the realization that this inner world is, is as immense as the cosmos outside. I have a gut feeling that awareness of the miracle of life is the purpose of life. I might never know. 
Um, next, we're going to um, uh, tell you a quote by Marbeth Schoen. Uh, she's written several books on um, Harry Batoya and Harry Batoya's uh, place in um, jewelry, in the jewelry studio movement. So she says, his early work was mostly cast from silver or gold. He melted the metal directly on a charcoal block in the open where he could work into the metal before it hardened. But Toya poured the molten metal and as it cooled, he worked on it by stirring, scraping, punching and adding water to cause areas to cool and splash. A second quote, is uh, Batoya was fascinated by the reflective qualities of metal and how the light played on the surface of highly polished planes. His pieces were often bone-like, organic shapes, articulated by the play of light and shadow on roughly textured surfaces and the interweaving rhythms of solids and voids. Harry Batoya, his modern monotype prints actually inspired and were done at the same time as his jewelry. Um, we see to the left here, we see a print of his that is from 1943 on microbiology. Um, and to the right, we see the two brooches. One on the top is uh, top uh, images from circa 1945. And you can see how it was inspired by the print on the left. And below that is another brooch from 1943 to 1950 that was inspired by this print. Harry Batoya, Jewelry Themes and Inspiration. Um, Europe's um, avant-garde, their uh, neo-vitalism um, was man's spiritual connection with nature. It had to do with vital force and energy. And I wanted to show you some examples of his jewelry that was inspired by neo-vitalism. So on the left here, um, you see this is a pendant. Um, you can see that it's forged out of silver. You can see the planishing marks here on the edges. You can see in the center here, you can see the woven silver wire. In the very central part, you see an ebony, um, an ebony pod, and you also it inserted into it are some ceramic beads. Um, to the right, these are examples of brooches that are also from the early 1940s and that are influenced by neo-vitalism. As we were talking about before, his monotypes and his jewelry are have a one-to-one -one connection. And on the top here, we saw this earlier and it was an untitled monotype. And it was, um, this, is, this is the inspiration for his ornamental centipede from 1942. Um, we can see in this ornamental centipede, this is articulated brass. We can see the rivets along the spine here. We can see the, the sort of the wilting um, appendages that are here. <laughs> um, and to the right, I wanted to um, just tell you how he was inspired by fellow, fellow contemporaries like Alexander Calder. So here are some examples um, of Alexander Calder's uh, wire sculptures. You see down below, you see his sculpture of a man's head from the 1930s. And to the right, um, you can see his spider mobile. And that's from 1939. And these are examples of Alexander Calder's work than it can be seen now in a MoMA exhibition that's modern from the start. And I'll tell you more about that at the end. Um, Harry Batoya was also inspired by nature, like um, images of growth and decay. Um, we can see on the left here, we can see a tree branch from 1942, and you can see the rivets along the spine here. This is out of, this is uh, forged and cold connected brass. Um, 
And on the right here, um, I wanted to show you a photograph of a, this is a wedding brooch that he designed for uh, Brigitte. Um, it's from 1943. Um, it's been suggested, you can see the images here, um, the appendages, um, it can be of a starfish. It's also been suggested it could be flowers. Um, the, two, uh, the two images, nat nature images are connected, the appendages are connected, and it's at a forged and cold connected 70 karat gold. And um, I just think it's just a lovely, lovely piece of his. Um, I want to read you um, a quote by Harry's son, um, Val Batoya. And he, uh, Val said uh, that uh, Harry Batoya was, above all, he was inspired by natural forms. He estimates that his father created 45 thousand examples of sculpture and he rarely named his sculptures but his sculptures fell within 17 major groups including bush dandelion free forms gongs straw tonals and trees um he was also inspired by the organic and the biomorphic so on the left here, we see a sheet of, uh, it's, you know, a print of his brooches from the early 1940s. And remember back when we saw that page of sketches um, of, you know, the 27 sketches of organic and biomorphic shapes? Well, here they are um, showing up in his brooches. Um, to the right, we can see um, an example here. This is a brooch and it actually is from 1943 and it's an amoeba shape and it's welded silver. And you can see little beads of riveted plastic here. And this um, sort of brownish color is actually a patina. Um, to the right, we see another brooch. Um, it's from 1946 of a person with arms raised and it's from forged and riveted silver. Um, Harry was also inspired by the cosmos and the randomness of the universe. And this is a hat pin to the left here. And we can see that it's uh, made from bent and forged silver wire. And these ceramic beads could be uh, represent uh, actually planets that are in orbit around the central. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to look at a video of his large sculptural commissions and public sculptures. Um, you're seeing on the left here, this is, I'd shown you an earlier photograph of this. This is once another view of that um, altarpiece screen that's in the MIT Cressage Chapel. Um, from 1953 until his death in 1978, Batoya pursued large sculptural commissions and completed more than 50 public sculptures throughout the United States. So we're going to switch to Jason now and he's going to show um, a video of his, of the sculptural, large sculptural commissions.
Okay, go ahead, Christine. Okay. So Harry Batoya, the last, the last image on our slide was of the Fontana Sonambient, 1978 Federal Reserve Bank sculpture. And that is one of his sound sculptures. So- I wanna go back to your share screen, Christine. I'm sorry. So once again, so the last image that was on the screen was of the Fontana Sonambient 1978 Federal Reserve Bank sculpture. And it's a public sculpture and it moves and sways and it's a tonal, one of his tonal sculptures. So this, so the sound or Sonambient sculptures, when they had the mad ex exhibitions, they were in the atmosphere for enjoyment, which was at the other end of the floor from the Bend, Cast and Forge exhibition of his jewelry. And um, we see on the left here, we see uh, Harry Batoya amongst some of his Sonambient sculptures. And I wanted to tell you that in 1960, he began developing his signature tonal sculptures and early ones approximated an upside down stool with rods, often of beryllium copper attached to a cross uh, mesh base. And so we're going to switch to a very short video. I wanted to show you Harry Batoya. He's going to be in his his barn in Bart, um, in Bardo, Pennsylvania, and you're going to be seeing him at, with his sculptures. So we're going to switch to Jason. To me, imagination is an active thing. When I look at a piece of metal, right away, I'm thinking of something to do with it. I now build sculptures that can move in, in the wind or that can be touched and played like an instrument. My works are all over the world, but for years, I've kept my best pieces at home, which is really my laboratory. That may seem strange, but I'm constantly testing my ideas to improve on them. I think that these sculptures provide a way for people to get an immediate response to my work. And that gives me satisfaction. Back to you, Christine, your screen share. Yep. So the last video we're going to be looking at is um, it's of Harry Batoya's wife, Brigitte, and she tells us um, or reveals how Harry got the idea to create these sound sculptures. And um, part of the video shows Brigitte playing his sound sculptures. And I thought that would be a real um, treat to see that. So we're going to go to Jason, back to Jason, and then. Can you just remind me where to stop, Christine? Uh, 5.55. And we were very eager to return to where the season changed. And have spring, you know, after the winter and summer and fall. So he came here and, and as a matter of fact, I sort of convinced him we should come here. And I took the blame on myself. I said, if you don't like Pennsylvania, I take the blame for it. And he said, all right, you do. And uh, he was here ever since and really loves it here. So it was turned out all right. He made uh, small sculptures that were supposed to look like desert grasses. And he found then when these little rods were touched and they were hitting each other that they made a sound. And his brother was a musician. And he said, oh, why don't you make these in different sizes or different metals? And uh, Harry said, yes, that's a good idea. 
And so he worked on those and he was fascinated and he started putting cylinders on and using different metals, different heights, and different sounds would come out. And then he had more and more and then finally filled the barn gradually and uh, got a whole orchestra together. And he spent much time in there recording the music he made. And we also have some records of the music. And the barn was fixed up almost sort of like a sound box to make the music sound better that way. They come all the time. They always want to hear a concert. And uh, I learned a little bit how to do it. I can do it about five minutes and give them an idea of what it sounds like. Well, I wouldn't really describe them, but I found that uh, people that came there each have a different idea. For instance, we had some nuns in there, and they would say, oh, it sounds like heavenly music or like church bells. And then we had some soldiers coming, and they said, oh, it sounds like airplanes or bombs. And then we have people who like nature, and they say, oh, it sounds like the ocean or a thunderstorm. So everybody gets their own idea. And, uh, well, to me, they're nature in a way, and yet they're something completely apart. You can't uh, compare with anything else. Okay, Christine. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, as as Brigitte demonstrated, so these signature tonal sculptures, um, many of them look like upside down stools with rods. They're often of beryllium copper, but he experimented with other, um, you know, metals as well, and. Um, some of the rods were capped with tiny cylinders and their rate would their weight would rustle um, the swaying of the others. So we have small ones, we have tall ones, we have short ones, we, we have large ones. Um, the sounding sculptures range in size from several inches up to 19 feet. And if you notice that she had a baton and she struck um, some large circular objects, those are his gongs which we saw as gong pendants, um, oh, so many years ago in his jewelry. Um, so in conclusion, in closing, I hope that, you have sh uh, that I've shown you today how Harry Batoya was a modern Renaissance man, an artist, a sculptor, a painter, a printmaker, a furniture designer, 
I'm um, a, a musician and a jewelry designer. His uh, Batoya's Credo clearly outlines his passion for artistic experimentation and discovery. He had an intuitive and improvisational approach to design materials, and he was in internationally renowned for his metalwork. And he's credited um, as a pioneer in the American studio jewelry movement. He created the first tonal sculptures, which he called Synambient. And um, this eclectic mad exhibition, um, which was bent, cast, and forged, and also atmosphere for enjoyment, um, shows Bert Batoya's versatility as an artist over four decades, um, as it shows how he started it all with, with designing jewelry. So um, I would like to hear if anyone has any questions and um, then I have some recommendations of some exhibitions that um, I would go see um, that would connect with my talk. You wanna stop your share? Mm -hmm. back. Go ahead, Keith. I'm surprised that that he was able to uh, secure the medals during the, during the war years. I mean, in 43, there was such a shortage of, of copper that pennies were made out of zinc. So right. I, well, I don't know how he was able to get gold, silver, unless he was melting down pre-existing. He was melting down pre-existing. Oh, okay. Mostly, that's what he was doing during the war. That's why he's. That's why he was so focused in the 1940s on jewelry because of the because of the rationing of metal. Yeah, I mean that was a big thing, and and but but then again, I I just recently finished reading a book about a certain socialite in New York City during the war years. There was never any shortage of wealth for them. So mm. I, you know, they, they, they had money up to yin yang. So, anyway. but yeah, it's, you know, gold and silver. I mean, they must've been scarce. Mm. Are there any other, are, are um, there other questions or are there anything in the chat room? That... Carol, what, what would you like to say? Uh, uh, one more, did, when it came to sculptures for corporations, was this, was this part of a, contest you know like you say like bank of america wants the sculpture i mean surely there was a what's, what's the word a, a broad reach to other artists until there was a like a competition and then he just happened to get elected for um i how did that i believe that he was fairly well well he started in the 1930s i mean he started in the 1930s and by that point so we were looking at i mean the public the mit and others you know that the, they were from 19 like the mit was in 1954 so by the 1950s and the 60s the golden dandelions he's pretty well known so. Okay. I mean, he's pretty well known. And those were commissions. I mean, they were large sculptural commissions and public commissions. And he, he, he created the category of sound or tonal sculptures. He created it. Um, Sonambian, the reason why we don't know Sonambian is because he, was able, he wasn't able to trademark the name. It's what he named his sculptures, his tonal sculptures, but he wasn't able to trademark the name. I wonder why. I'm not sure. I didn't go, I didn't yeah, research I that. <laughs> I didn't research that. I was just, I just read that, 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 uh, so he referred to them as sonambient sculptures, but he wasn't able to, he wasn't able to trademark no. the name. Uh, Carol, go ahead. And then Virginia, you're after that. Um, I was really very intrigued by the um, pins, the one that you referred to as looking something like an amoebic shape. Yes. With the little dots on it. Yes. And it was very reminiscent. I don't know if you can see it on my cell phone, but um, oh. I can remember in the 50s wearing a mother of pearl pin and it had little dots on it, of course, representing the different colors in the color palette. But the shape itself and the way the brushes ran through to me was almost identical to, to his uh, pen or, or jewelry, which of course was, I don't believe it was his intent to create the artist palette. But I think it's an interesting observation that 
that with certain times, there are certain shapes that become um, important or uh, are used in many decorative arts or different mm -hmm. ways in different uh, decorative arts. So um, this just made me think of that little pin that I adored wearing when I was uh, in elementary school. So mm -hmm. uh, it has an interesting history, or I think. Yes. Virginia, go ahead. Well, I, I, first of all, I want to thank you for introducing me to uh, Ari Toya. I frankly never heard of him before, except I think I've seen his jewelry on Antique Roadshow. Probably. And, <laughs> yeah, because I, I've seen those things, especially the, I, the, the fish hook or necklace or the necklace. I noticed that the necklace was the same design as the centerpiece. It was very similar. Anyway, I really enjoyed it, and I enjoyed the Italian. And I wondered why he spoke in Italian and not in English, but because uh, he lived here in Pennsylvania. He probably thought his Italian was better than his English. So he had an interpreter. Or they, you know, well, his... well, you know, he immigrated here. He is an American. He's an American artist, designer, artist, but he, he immigrated from, you know, with his father, you know. Um, Did he go back to Italy and do shows? Um, Couldn't have done he, visited, the he visited, but um, so if you want to explore more of, about Harry Vitoya, yes, um, there's a foundation. There's a foundation that he, there's a Harry Vitoya foundation, and I can send it to uh, the link to Holly, and you can go on there and you can see his portfolio for, you know, jewelry and sound sculptures and photographs. And you can see some of the videos. They have other videos that I didn't, I found some of the videos there. Um, okay, good, because I belong to a class, an Italian class at the library. Oh. <laughs> I think I think they would love to and, see this. And they're, and, and, the, and I'm gonna so, ask them all if they've ever heard of Harry Batoya. I'd be okay. interested to know how many well, of like 12 people would have heard of him because right. I've never heard the, I mean, I'm sure I heard the name before, but, it's not like Cartier or, I mean, it just doesn't, right, right. not familiar. I'm delighted to know about And the videos are in Italian, actually. Oh, good. They're in Italian. Okay. So you may enjoy that. Yeah. <laughs> you can, you can I, share I with them about the, the lecture and then you can go in and, 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 and watch the videos in Italian. <laughs> right, and I think they love that. So just go to the uh, Batoya Foundation and I'll find- It's Harry Batoya, Harry Batoya Foundation. I can okay. send the link to Holly. Okay, that would be great. Thank okay. you very much. I really yeah. enjoyed this today. I, you you're, I hope you're coming questions. back with more decorative arts. <laughs> so, <laughs> <For> so <jewelry. laughs> um, other things besides jewelry. So, so, so let me just, so if there's no other questions, so I just want to share with you. So now that we're on, now we're talking about like, we're talking about, you know, um, studio jewelry and the American studio movement and jewelry. So, or that time period. So two exhibitions that are happening right now. So I'm just going to hold, I'll done a second. I'm going to show you um, two things. So one is, um, so this is an exhibition since uh, that's currently at, MAD, M-A-D, which is a Museum of Arts and Design. This museum is one of my favorites in New York City. It's a, uh, it's in Columbus Circle um, area in New York City. And they have an ongoing exhibition that you really should see. And it's 45 stories in jewelry from 1947 till now. And where is this? It's in New York City. Oh, um, they own their own building. I know, what's um, the a Museum of Arts and Design, MAD. They call it MAD. Okay. Museum of Arts and Design. That's and it's an ongoing exhibition. And um, I think you'll really find it fascinating. Um, it's, Are those brass knuckles? <laughs> you know, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't gotten to go like to the really exhibition because of, knuckles. because of, they do, you should check to see, I believe they're open Thursday through Sunday. I mean, you have to check because of COVID, you know, they have, there's days they're open and days they're closed. So um, yeah, this reminds me of a multi 
finger ring. Mm. Yeah. In mm. other words, the, your, your first digit is the free one. But it, I mean, I see some of the movie stars, you know, they got a ring that covers two fingers or something. But here you got it covered more <laughs> four. But it yeah, it's like a to, lucky charm one. Yeah, yeah right. Close to uh, uh, Talk about your next two lectures, which are in August. Chris will be back with us. Okay. Wait, let me let me give you one more thing. So, okay. So um some of the pieces that were featured in my talk today, because he was really, really uh, good friends with uh, Alexander Calder, is you must see this exhibition. So this is at MoMA. It's modern from the start. It's Alexander Calder. It has, you can see as you enter MoMA, on the left hand, you see a wall full of his sketches. There's videos to see of Alexander Calder working on his mobiles. You'll see his, uh, you'll see maquettes as well as, um, which are scaled studies of his sculptures, his uh, sculptures and also mobiles. You'll see, and it's only there till August. So I have, I have a quick question. We've all, some of us might have seen the Calder because it was at Pepsi, some of the Calders. It wasn't at the Pepsi Cola company in oh, White Plains for a while. Am I right? Pepsi yeah, so that's long. Where is the closest Bertoya sculpture to Connecticut? Oh, I don't know. Do you know? No. <laughs> <laughs> Go so don't, don't go to see one. <laughs> but I'll probably find out from the foundations where they are. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. I don't expect you to know everything. <laughs> so what are your next two presentations here, Christine? Oh, I'm sorry. So um, so I'm going to come back in August. Um I have uh, I, I have a talk scheduled on August 16th from three to four. Um, and that's going to be um, on seeing um, um, a, um, Louis Comfort Tiffany and Tiffany Studio in a New Light, because what we're going to be focusing on is Clara Driscoll and the Tiffany girls. So um, we've heard a lot about Tiffany and his studio, but we haven't heard about um, how, sorry, what? You know, there's a book in the library about the Tiffany, the, the people that were working on the glass. Oh, for Tiffany. I, I read it, but I can't remember the name or I guess it was about Clara. Because it was well, Clara Driscoll, the Clara Driscoll was his secret weapon was she he she was the top designer for him. Designer, yeah, yeah, the whole book and on it. Whole book on her. And there's it's a fairly current book and I've looked at it and I'm going to take highlights from that and it's important to know about Clara Driscoll and the Tiffany girls and how you know um you know pieces like you know the wisteria lamp or the peonies lamp how how you know Tiffany pieces like that were created yeah, they had a hard time keeping their job because the men wanted their jobs. Yes. If I recall. Yes. Yes. And what's the second one? Uh, the second one is August 23rd and from three to four. And it's going to feature um, Edgar Brandt um, and Art Deco Ironwork. Mm -hmm. Are these are in now, Solomon? No. No, it's on Zoom. These are on Zoom. These are both on Zoom. Good. I uh, just say one thing. Uh, here, look over here. Holly, last, here. Yeah, probably. Uh, here I am. Last summer, I read a book about. It was called um, "Behind Every Man." Dot dot dot. <laughs> and the finish is is a good woman, but um, it was about Nancy Russell. I think her name's Nancy Russell. Charles Russell, who's a Western famous Western artist and really kind of a colleague to um, Remington. And it's all about her, his, uh, Charles Russell's wife. And without his wife, there would be no Charles Russell because he wanted to paint and he wanted to be artistic and he had no interest in marketing his talent or his artwork. 
And um, so it's a very interesting book. It's, it's, as I said, Behind Every Man, dot, dot, dot. And it's about um, Nancy Russell. So it was an interesting read that, you know, women were in the, women were into art and in the background, but, you know, we weren't in the foreground when um, back in the, this is 40s, I think. That we, would I be right, Charles Russell Remington? That was the illustrator, so, which Westport's famous for. So. Hmm. Thank you, Christine, very much. Great presentation. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Thank you. It's always birthday Monday, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we'll see you later. Keith, I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Holly and Jason, for bringing us this program. Sure. No problem. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Very Thank much. you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye, Jason. Bye.